Sunrise, the mist clears, exposing the oncoming British force. Rocket fire lighting their way. Miss your lines. Jackson calls to his men. They are near enough now, gentlemen. You may fire when ready. A Kentucky rifleman remembers how his fellow defenders responded to Old Hickory's orders. Steady, boys. Hold your fire. Take aim! Fire! Then the heavy iron cannon and some thousands of small arms joined in and made the ground shake under our feet. As soon as the firing began, Captain Patterson came running along. He shouted, shoot low, boys, shoot low, break them. These Americans, instead of fleeing, stood there and decimated the British line. One cannon blast, they said, knocked out 100 British soldiers. Americans fired right into the faces of these men. It was like roaring hell, said one commentator. The confusion in the British ranks spreads among one column led by General John Gibbs. Instead of rushing the Americans head on, they pause to return fire, including the 44th Regiment. It is a fatal mistake witnessed by a British officer. Instantly, the whole American line, from the swamp to the point past its center, was ablaze. In less time than one could write it, the 44th foot was literally swept from the face of the earth. Gibbs's column continues its advance. Soldiers scramble into the ditch in front of the American line, but without extra ladders, they cannot scale the rampart and become easy targets for Americans pouring fire directly into the column. Panic breaks out and erupts into widespread chaos. Gibbs rides forward to rally his wavering men, but gets caught in the deadly fire and falls from his horse, mortally wounded. Soon after, General Keene also goes down. As the British command begins to crumble, Jackson exudes a calm confidence, observing the battle near the center of the American line. But while the center and the left hold strong, the right remains vulnerable. British troops, led by Colonel Robert Rennie, managed to storm the rampart. Bayonets clash and gunshots fire at point-blank range in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. At this crucial point in the battle, the British have their best chance to break through the American line. But without reinforcements, Rennie is a dead man as soon as he begins his charge. The commanders of the two primary columns have been mortally wounded or killed. Other field officers are dead. There's no one left to command. Pankinham moves forward to try and rally retreating troops. He's hit in the knee. His horse is killed. His aide gets him another horse. But another round of grape shot rings out. He's hit. This time, it's fatal. He's hit through the arm and the spine. He's hit in the lungs, and he falls to the ground, dying. The British Army has lost its commander. In just 20 minutes, the British High Command has been obliterated. The survivors realize they will never reach New Orleans and halt the attack. Improbably, Old Hickory's ragtag army has just trounced the world's best fighting force in little more than two hours. When the battle was over and Jackson came out to see, you know, the carnage, there were some men on the bottom, on the, on the ground, who were still alive, and their arms and legs started to come up through the bodies of the men who had fallen on top of them. And Jackson said it reminded him of the resurrection when the dead would rise from their graves. It was quite a scene.
More than 2,000 British soldiers have been killed, wounded, reported missing, or taken prisoner. Americans report only 13 dead and several dozen wounded. There has never been in the annals of military history such a lopsided victory as Andrew Jackson had in defeating the British. It made no sense. Who could believe such a victory? It proved to the American people for all time that by God they did have the ability and the will and the leadership to defeat any country that might try to invade us. It had been in question no more thanks to General Andrew Jackson and the men and women who fought in the Battle of New Orleans. On February 4th, nearly four weeks after the battle, news of the victory reaches Washington. The capital goes wild. Glory be to God that the barbarians have been defeated, blared a local newspaper. Glory to Jackson. Glory to the militia. Sons of freedom. Benefactors of your country. All hail. There's a new sense of national pride. Uh, there's a patriotic verver where they're voicing things of American virtue and American purity and American values as they had not been since the revolution. Nine days later, the peace delegation returns to Washington with the Treaty of Ghent, formally ending the War of 1812. The terms of the treaty merely restored territorial boundaries and maritime rights to what they were before the conflict. Ironically, the treaty doesn't resolve the chief cause, impressment, which had ceased to be an issue with the end of the Napoleonic War. Congress ratifies the treaty on February 17th. This War of 1812, started for seemingly such small reasons, will end up defining modern America. This war will confirm manifest destiny. It will lead America into the new age. The result of the war enormously changed the capacity of the United States to exist as an independent country under a Republican constitution. John Adams himself said that Madison's conduct of the war and the way it ended gained more glory for the country than all of his three predecessors put together. John Adams was not used to giving praise when it wasn't deserved. Both James Madison and Andrew Jackson, unlikely allies, are hailed as heroes. Despite their flaws, the strengths of these two men would reverberate far beyond the War of 1812. Together, they would embody the personification of a new republic. These two very different men are able to bring Americans together and help them get through this very difficult time because their leadership and their beliefs represent a very broad spectrum when you put them together. That's going to be the future of America. News of the victory spreads a euphoric nationalism throughout the country. But not everyone is celebrating. Those who oppose the war are about to pay dearly. The Federalist delegates who had pushed for secession are labeled as traitors. But for Andrew Jackson, the savior of New Orleans, his heroic exploits catapult him from the battlefield to the White House as the nation's seventh president in 1829. His election confirms the coming of age of a new America, forged by men who shaped the times through which they passed. The War of 1812 shouldn't be forgotten because that's a turning point in the development of American democracy, American government, the American sense of who we are. It was the one moment that we needed psychologically to prove that we had a right to exist as an independent and free nation. And we did it at that time. After the War of 1812, we proved we were here to stay. And that's why I think it should be remembered by all Americans today. History remembers the War of 1812 as the Forgotten War. It is a story of courage, endurance, and a little bit of luck. 
forged by fire, united by will. A young nation defied the odds and won.